today we're going to be talking about converting a regular carburetor to E85. I have questions all the time if whether or not someone needs to buy a conversion kit to convert their carburetor to E85. And really, I was in the same boat not too long ago when I had the same questions. By building my own E85 carburetor and then later getting my hands on a factory E85 carburetor, I was able to pinpoint exactly what needed to be done in order to run E85 efficiently through your carburetor. So we're going to go through a few things that you're going to need to do in order to accomplish this. But for the most part, the way your carburetor sits right now, 90% of the components that are in it should work perfectly fine. You're definitely going to need to drill things out and some things are going to have to be replaced. And we're going to go through those one by one. So starting with the basics, we have our main body. This is a 750 main body with down leg boosters. This is an E85 mechanical secondary carburetor by Proform. They have their E85 version of the 750 with down leg boosters and then they have their gasoline version with down leg booster and they have their alcohol version. I don't have their alcohol version, but their gasoline version is in my 1973 Dodge Charger turbo car. And this was in my 1975 Dodge W100 turbo truck. My truck has an LS in it and my car has a big block Mopar in it, both the same 750 and I was able to tune both of them. One of them is gasoline, one of them is E85. So on the main body itself, when you buy the dedicated E85 carburetor, the boosters are going to be a little bit different. The orifices are going to be a little bit larger. The boosters are going to be a slightly different design versus our gasoline counterparts, but for all intents and purposes, it should work perfectly fine as it is. The air bleeds I've noticed are different. They're set up a little bit smaller on E85 carburetor carburetors about five sizes so if your carburetor came with a 70 you might have to drop down to a 65 and if your car came with a 30 or a 35 on the high speed you might have to drop it down to a 30 or 25 but I wouldn't actually touch those until you get into the nitty-gritty of the tune moving to the outside of the carburetor that would be the fuel bowls for the most part, the fuel bowl should have no problem handling the E85. A lot of them are zinc, this one's aluminum, and there should be no problem. They should all be resistant to E85. If you let E85 sit, you'll get like a bunch of crud on the bottom of the uh, fuel bowls. For the most part, there's no pitting and there's no corrosion. Regardless, this has been in my truck for almost a year and there's been pretty much no damage as far as I can tell. The umbrella gasket or the check valve for the accelerator pump is the same orange material that they use for the gasoline carburetors so that doesn't have to change either the passage for the accelerator pump nozzle is the same size as the gasoline one so that does not have to change either when we talk about the accelerator pump diaphragm itself this is a gasoline one and then this one is suited for alcohol or E85. You notice that the color is a little bit different because instead of rubber, it uses whatever this material is. I don't remember off the top of my head, but if you remember that green is E85 safe, then you should be good to go. If you have these black ones, they will hold up, but they won't hold up for very long. Eventually, you're going to notice that they're going to start to seize up. They're going to start to get stiff and they might even start cracking. So in a pinch, if you have to use them, if that's all you have, go ahead and use them. You should be fine. But keep in mind that eventually you're going to either have to upgrade to the 30cc green ones, or in my case, I went big and I went 50cc. Is the 50cc necessary? That will actually depend on your individual build and whether or not your car actually requires the extra pump shot. You won't actually know until you're actually on the road, going through the gears, trying to get in and out of traffic. I found that cars are happier running a bigger pump shot than not enough pump shot. So it's a little better to go too much than not enough on the accelerator pump diaphragms. Jumping over to the top of the fuel bowl, uh, I've already taken out the needle and seat, but I've got the needle and seat right here in my hand. So this one that came in my factory 85 carburetor is a 130 needle and seat. In the gasoline version of the 750, it's a 110. And then in the alcohol version that I made, it was a 150. The only difference is that in the middle of the needle and seat, that hole will be bigger. So it'll be 110 thousandths, 130, or 150 thousandths. In this E85 version, we have a stainless steel needle. And in the alcohol version, it is also a stainless steel needle. And I do not remember in the gasoline version if it's a stainless steel needle or not. But regardless, stainless steel is what you're going to want to go with when you're going with E85. 
The O-rings will also wear out prematurely in a regular gasoline application. I gotta double check the size, but I believe it's a 1.5 by 1.5 by 5 millimeter, and that should be the O-ring that fits in here. You could also look it up, I believe, on BPT on eBay, and they sell the O-rings for it. If you go to the parts store, you can buy the brown O-rings, and the brown O-rings will handle diesel, they'll handle E85, gasoline. You just have to be careful when you put them in and out of the carburetor that the threads in here or where the needle and seats sit don't have any kind of sharp edges where it'll rip the o-ring because if the o-ring's ripped then the whole thing's jacked up but i've never ran anything smaller than a 130 my first carburetor i built with 150s and i never had a problem my engine was making over 600 horsepower with the 130s so i wouldn't really be worried if whether or not the 130s will flow but if you can get your hands on 150s and they're roughly the same price, then I would definitely go with the 150s. You're just going to have to be a little bit more careful with the regulator because as it gets bigger, these needles are a little bit more susceptible to fuel pressure because you're going to have more volume pushing up against the tip of the needle. So as a precaution, just make sure you have the fuel pressure dialed so you don't go out and flood your carburetor. The one thing I will say about the needle and seat is that you should be switching over to the nylon gaskets. As you guys can see, we have these white nylon gaskets here. If you can run the paper ones but they are going to get stuck and they are going to come apart i have paper ones under the accelerator pump nozzles and every time i've ever taken them apart they've always ripped in fact i took those apart recently and they ripped on the way out i had the paper gasket in between the base plate and the main body and it ripped as well so any kind of paper gasket consider it only a single time use because you're not going to be able to use it again as for the float itself you really want to be running nitro fill floats and and that doesn't matter if it's a gasoline or an E85 or an alcohol. You just go ahead and run the nitro fill floats. Oh, forget about the brass. There's just too many problems. There's too many cons. You can pick up a kit with the notch floats and the jet extensions for not much money. And even if you don't run the jet extensions in the front, you could still run the notch floats on both the front and the back like this carburetor is running as well. As for the gaskets that go in between the main body and the metering block, Proform sells some really good ones. I've taken this one apart specifically, I wanna say 15 to 20 times when I was dialing in the tune of my carburetor and there's not a single tear and it has formed very well to the main body. So I remember that they were having problems keeping these in stock, but if they are in stock, go ahead and pick yourself up a set because these are actually really good. I also have gaskets from different companies, black ones, blue ones, red ones, and they all do well they all do very well but i haven't been as impressed as i have been with the proform ones they're still malleable they still work really well they almost feel like they're like a leather versus these that uh, these are obviously paper gaskets and i do tend to reuse my gaskets a lot because i just do so much tuning so whenever possible i do try to save the gaskets the proform ones are actually a more of a high flow design and they're specifically designed for their metering blocks in the standard metering block these holes right here that go to the boosters are a little bit smaller and in fact i'll go grab one of those gaskets that i just had right now uh, to prove my point is that we have the gasket sitting here and you see this hole right here and yeah you still have a hole right here that'll lead to the booster but if we overlay the red gasket on top you'll be able to see the red hole is significantly larger than the black hole then if we overlay it directly over the metering block itself you'll see that the red gasket is matched perfectly to the holes where the boosters are supposed to go. Does this help flow? Um, I'm not sure, but it can't hurt flow because it's perfectly matched to where it's gonna go. And depending on your horsepower level, sometimes you need to squeeze out as much flow as you can. In a pinch, can you use the other gaskets? Of course you can. Again, you probably might be sacrificing a little bit of flow. Worst case scenario, there's no difference between the gaskets and the flow rate. Best case scenario is when you match these two, it flows a little bit more. So, so really this is one of those few no-lose situations. The metering block is the thing that people are most concerned about. And that's because 90% of the tuning is in the metering block from what I've seen is that the stock metering block will flow enough E85 through the internal channels. What you will have to modify are the areas where the idle feed restrictors go, the power valve restrictors go, but typically the emulsion circuit is left untouched. So well, let's go ahead and go through those one by one. So the idle feed restrictors in one of the older factory carburetors, the restrictor actually ends up down here. In this carburetor, because of the way these orifices are designed, they could not have 
the idle feed restrictor down here and they actually moved it up to the top. A lot of aftermarket companies actually do move the idle feed restrictor on top. It tends to be better when the restrictor's on the bottom because then it's submerged in fuel. But the reason they move it up on top is because the channel is a lot larger so they can fit a larger bleed screw up on top than they can on the bottom. On the bottom, they're limited in surface area on the size of the bleed screw that they can use. So if you're planning to use replaceable bleed screws, remove the one that's out in the middle, drill out the hole to a decent size, and then move the restrictor up on top. Once you add your restrictor up on top, you can go up 40, 50, 60 thousandths up on top and you shouldn't have any problems with flow on the idle feed restrictors. The power valve restrictor channels are basically the same thing. You're gonna see that I have two sets of channels here and that's because I made these channels that are right here and this is because my carburetor is set up for a blow through application. If your carburetor is not set up for blow through, you don't need this extra set of channels because this is just gonna be way too much fuel for a standard carburetor. The channels that come in a Proform carburetor actually come pre-drilled and tapped for replaceable bleeds. I believe the factory channel is 40 thousandths, could be 50 or 60 thousandths, but it really doesn't matter because you're gonna be drilling it up as you need to. I haven't built an E85 carburetor where a fuel channel has to go smaller. They always go bigger because you need about 30% more fuel flow through the same channels. The question really that comes up is, are the stock components large enough to handle the extra fuel flow? And really, you can think about this question in another way. If your engine was making 30% more horsepower on gasoline, would your carburetor be able to handle it? And nine times out of 10, the answer is gonna be yes. So if it'll handle 30% more horsepower, it should be able to handle 30% more fuel flow by default. The intricacies actually come from when you dive into the tuning portion itself, and in which case, I would definitely follow the pyramid that I came up with in terms of tuning. The reality is that if you take your carburetor, you drain out all the gasoline and you top it off with E85, you start it up, if you follow my pyramid that I came up with, you should be able to take your gasoline carburetor and tune it to E85. If you wanted to reuse all your existing gaskets and all your existing diaphragms and run it as an E85 carburetor, you could. You would just have a couple more point of failures, but as those items wear out and you need to replace them, just replace them with the proper equipment. It's not as if you're gonna dump in E85 today and then tomorrow the car is gonna be leaking. That's just not how it works. I'll leave a link to my pyramid video Video somewhere on here if not it'll be in the description down below I will see you guys all in the next one night wrencher out